about those words, you deliver me from my enemies. And that is exactly what we're talking about today, the giant slayer, the giants. Now, I know last week I gave a really, really challenging message. I got a lot of good feedback from it. I appreciate that, but I promise today it's not going to sting so badly. At least it doesn't for me. You know, anything that gets to you has to go through me first. You all know that, right? I'm up there. You don't see my tears. You don't see my spankings. And thank you, Lord. Can I have another spanking and things like that? You don't get to see any of that. That happens in private in my study. But I, this is so amazing, y'all. I learned so many hidden nuggets this week to share with you. I'm so excited because I love finding these deep little truth things that I've missed. And there's even a truth grenade in here today. I'm not even going to tell you what it is. I think it'll jump out to you when we get to it. But today is going to be different, okay? So relax, kick back. It's going to be a little bit odd, Okay. How many were here, not last year, but in 2015, after our angels and demons, when I did an entire message just on the giants? Is anybody, was anybody here for that? Okay, all right, okay, well, I need to recap a little bit. Let me just spend like just a few minutes bringing us up to speed as to what in the world is happening here. Last week, we looked a little bit at the heroic exploits of Joshua and Caleb. Y'all remember that? And he dared to be different, and that was, that was our challenge to go, and uh, some of you even took the challenge and went out and paid for somebody in line behind you at the uh, McDonald's or whatever. I heard a report just this morning of someone who did that, paid for someone, and the car behind them, she drove off. She heard someone yell, thank you, but it wasn't the car that was just paid for. It was the car behind them thanking the car behind the one who had paid for you. See what's happening? The chain reaction had begun. It had already started. They had paid for the one. They had passed the blessing on. So I'm so glad you guys are are taking these challenges to heart. There is a challenge at the end of this, but I want to give us a little history lesson here. When Joshua and Caleb went to Canaan and they were spying out the promised land, they came back with a report. And the report diverged, right? Ten said this, two said this. Joshua and Caleb were the men of faith. They were bold. They said, hey, we can do this. I don't care if there's giants in the land. They said, you don't understand. We, we saw like Nephilim, like the sons of Anak, and they saw this bizarre verse. Read it with me. It says, and there we saw Nephilim. What is that? And the sons of Anak, who's that? Descended from the Nephilim. In our eyes, we seem like grasshoppers. And so we were in their eyes too. I'm sure they looked at us and thought, you're a grasshopper. We squash you like a June bug. And, and it was going to be one of those battles that no wonder the 10 came back and said, we can't do this. In our flesh, man, we look at giants and these ferocious people and... I tremble. You know that. I've confessed to you. I have a recurring nightmare that the Incredible Hulk is chasing me. And (laughs) thank you for laughing at my pain. This is this is serious to me. And and I can't escape him because he's so big and he's strong. I mean, what do you do? I mean, you can't flex back at him or scare him or anything. And that's how I feel when we see the tribe of the Anakim and the Nephilim. What in the world is that? I don't have time to go into the story of the Nephilim today. If you want to read Genesis six four, you can talks about the unholy mingling of fallen angels and, and the daughters of men, and, and they created this incredible race of supergiants that was horrible and corrupt and blasphemous and crude and wicked, so much so that it hastened the flood, okay? If you want to hear more about that, go back and listen to my message in 2015 called Giants, okay? And I'll explain the whole thing. Today, we're going to move on into the sons of Anak, which we really didn't get a chance to go into, but it plays right into what happens next with Joshua and Caleb. They come, they bring this report back, we're grasshoppers in their sight, I don't understand what's going on here, but if you look in scripture, it's not just here that you see bizarre reports, it's all over the Bible. In fact, it happened, there's so many reports of giants and freakishly large beast-like race that you can't even count them all. I mean, there's so many in here that we'll just scratch the surface, but they're mentioned in God's word for a reason, and we should take notice, because I think honestly, be honest, We look at these, and we read these bizarre accounts, and we just kind of gloss over them, right? Like, there were giants in the land in those days. Huh, that's weird. What's for dinner? And we move on, right? That's what we do, because how does that apply to me today? It does. It is so amazing. God's truth has for us. They're there for a reason. When the five kings in Abraham's day went out and started to talk uh, about this whole what would eventually be known as the promised land. We see different tribes being known. And these tribes are not talked about like other tribes. They have bizarre names like Rephaim, which means sons of Rapha, terrible ones, or Zuzim, or even Zamzumim, which are these tyrannical, ruling, beast-like creatures. And then you see the most feared of all these Nephilim tribes, the Anakim. 
And the Anakim are the ones that are the most ferocious and the most feared. Their name literally means sons of Anak who are crushing tyrants. That's what the name actually translates up. Last week we saw how brave Caleb was and how God says he had a different spirit. And he was not afraid to stand alone and to stand out from the crowd because he fully trusted God. And he believed that these Anakim giants would fall before his hand. He believed that. Why? How in the world can we beat a giant? These Anakim were bad dudes. I cannot tell you how feared they were. I cannot tell you this. I mean, generations of people tremble before them. They were the descendants of a notorious giant named Anak. Anak was the grandson or the, the, the son. We're not sure yet because Scripture only says that he was a, a forefather here. He was the son or grandson of a giant that was greatly feared named Arba. Arba. Say Arba with me. Arba. Now, if that sounds vaguely familiar, it's because Arba would later move to America and start a fast food chain known as Arby's. Okay. So, all right. You're listening. See, I was just making sure you're with me. The reason why Arba sounds familiar is because there is a city named after him called Kiriath Arba. You may not recognize that name because you know it today as the city of Hebron. Hebron. This is the city of Arba. Arba was so great. In fact, Joshua goes on and he tells you how great he is. He says Arba was the greatest man among all the Anakim. So among all the giants, Arba was this super leader that was feared. And the city was actually named after him. So in Joshua chapter 14, Caleb goes before Joshua. They've just had this great conquest. And they said, I want this portion of the land. Okay, Caleb deserves it. They fought. They've had a great time. Things are going well. And he says, when we carve up the land... I want to pick this spot right here. Guess what Caleb wanted? Kiriath Arba. He wanted Hebron. He says, give me that. This guy could have anything he wanted. Remember, he was one of the original two who said, we can do this. He could pick anything in the land flowing of milk and honey, yet he chooses Kiriath Arba. This city, why? He wanted to be the one to go in and finally drive out these giants. What is his problem? How bold, how brave, or how crazy do you have to be to want to go and say, mm, no, 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 no. where are the big guys? I want that city. And he says, that's what I want. And he chose Hebron, Kiriath Arba, as his place because he had such faith and trust in the Lord. So let me ask right off the bat, how about you? Does your faith and trust in the Lord inspire you to unprecedented, bold, crazy heroics? Acts of bravery, acts of boldness that, let's be honest, in the face of, like, our human wisdom, this does not make sense. This guy's nuts. Man, I see a giant coming. I'm going the other way. He's like, where? let me at him. Let me go. Let me go. And he, we don't hear anything about his description of him being some impressive, strong guy. He just had a crazy faith and trust in the Lord. Remember, these weren't just slightly large men. This is not like Caleb says, I'm going to go into town, and I'm going to battle a couple dozen Archies, or a couple dozen shacks. You know what I'm saying? They trembled when they saw them. Some reports in history actually say they were two and three times the size of men, that they were some bizarre, unholy mingling. And we can read about that, and, and it, again, trust me on this, but it is bizarre how feared and how notorious they were and how blasphemous. Remember this. They were wicked far beyond normal men. Hear that, okay? There's a reason for this. So, People, oh, I hear these atheists try to dismiss this and these ultra-liberal scholars who self-proclaim, no, no, this, this, don't believe what God's Word said. They had a, a, a pituitary gland disorder. They were, they had what was known as gigantism, right? They were like seven, seven, two, things like that. <laughs> Some even say that the pituitary gland disorder made Goliath's head bulbous and soft on the front so that the stone could really sink in and hurt him hard and that's not what Scripture says. I'm going with this. And what it says here is these men were fearful, and they were massive. And when people came back, they trembled. They said, man, we're like grasshoppers. There is no way this unholy intermixing before the flood. And some, some reason, they loved Canaan. They loved to settle around the area of the promised land. Why is that? Oh, man, there's so much gold here. These tribes of giants would be fought by tribes of normal men. Our size people, okay? 
And yet we outnumbered them and we had God on our side that we were eventually able to fight them off, beat them, and drive them from God's promised land. Just like he said. Y'all remember back in Deuteronomy, Moses and his tribe actually talk about this. They battle and kill a mighty giant known, exact, we know his name, as Og, the king of Bashan, over in the Golan Heights. You may remember this. Read it with me here. It says, next, we turned and went up the road toward Bashan. And Og, king of Bashan, with his whole army, marched out to meet us at the battle of Adri. The Lord said to me, do not be afraid of him. Well, why does the Lord have to tell Moses that? the one who fears nothing like this. Do not be afraid of him, for I have delivered him into your hands. You're going to hear that phrase again in a minute. Not only him, but along with his whole army. Oh, and his land. Do to him what you did to Sion, king of the Amorites, who reigned in Heshbon. So the Lord our God also gave into our hands Og, king of Bashan, and all the armory. We struck them down, leaving a few survivors. No, leaving no survivors. It was total victory. And if you read on in verse 11, and you were here a couple years ago, you remember this really interesting tidbit, which I love. Something very cool and very specific about Og's side. He, he says, Og, the king of Bashan, was the last of the Rephaites. Your, your Bible may say Rephaim, or it may even say giants. His bed was decorated with iron and was more than nine cubits long and four cubits wide. It is still in Rabbah of the Ammonites. So Og has this bed that is between 13 and a half feet and 15 and a half feet long, depending on which cubit you use. See, we don't grasp that. We think, oh, that's big. You know, okay, it's like almost the size of the stage. Let me show you, just so we can grasp this, this size comparison, if that helps. That's next to a six-foot-tall person, six-foot-nine just to get into it. King Ogsbet, think about this. Now, have you ever bought a piece of furniture that came in a box? Oh. There's a special place for a person who invented furniture you have to assemble, okay? <laughs> I'm not even going to name that store that shall not be named, but it's from Switzerland or whatever, Swiss, and, and it comes in a box, and it is evil. But there are furniture that you know that you can buy because it's so big you can't get it into your house. But you bring it into your house, and then some assembly required, right? You call friends, <laughs> and they help you put it together, and it's so big and so massive, and it is such a nightmare that you're like, you know what? Even if we move, that thing's staying, right? Right? You bought the house, that's yours. That conveys whatever it is, massive bed, massive dresser, whatever. That's what I think of when I read this verse. When I hear this strange thing, his bed was so massive, it's still in Rabab, the Ammonites. You, you can go check it out today. It's like a tourist attraction. You know, like, you bought the city, that bed's yours. That's what I think of when I see that. It's so crazy big to us. They don't take apart iron. and It's just, it's just when we're talking about Og, I love these little hidden gems. If you're an English teacher, or you like to know the origins of words, or get into the etymology of a word, og is rumored to believe the source of another word we use today in our English language. I'll give you a hint right here. Anybody know? Yeah? Who is that? What is he? And if I had pronounced it King Og of Bashan, you would have made the connection right away. Fearsome, giant, terrible beast, the definition of an ogre. And that's where they say this was actually rooted back possibly in something legitimate and actually in your Bible. All right, so later, Joshua and his brave men drive out the three remaining sons of Anak. Okay, they go to Hebron in this first campaign, but something goes wrong. Evidently, these giants reoccupy the city of Hebron while Joshua goes up north to the battle of the northern cities in Canaan. So what happens is Caleb comes back and he retakes Hebron and finishes off the three giants. And God's word is so specific, we actually know their names. Read it with me. It says, in accordance with the Lord's command to him, Joshua gave to Caleb, son of Jephunneh, a portion of Judah, Kiriath Arba. There it is. What do you want? You want Kiriath Arba? Okay, I'll give it to you. It's yours. That is Hebron. Arba was the forefather of Anak. That's how we know right there. From Hebron, Caleb drove out the three remaining Anakites, Sheshai, Ahimon, and Talmai, the sons of Anak. Y'all, that's pretty specific. Now today, we move ahead to 1 Samuel, and here is where it gets so good. Here is where we read David and Saul fight a remnant of giants who had taken refuge in a Philistine city known as Gath. Now, young people, who do you think David fights? What famous giant lives in Gath? Goliath, yes, you got it. The fearsome Goliath. Here he is in this city. Now, very rarely does Scripture mention specific height for somebody. 
It does a few times. Like when it mentions King Saul is a head taller than all his peers. Saul was a big guy, but he wasn't like this. And Goliath, as massive as he was, believe it or not, he's not even close to the tallest of the giants. He wasn't even one of the, the strong ones that preceded him from the tribe of Anak, all the way going back up to, to their roots with the Nephilim. There is a hint in Amos that gives us just a glimpse of how crazy big these guys were when they reference things like being as tall as cedar trees and as strong as oaks. Now think about that. It's not just like an allegory or a metaphor. Nobody goes up and compares their basketball guy, man, he's like a cedar tree. He's as strong as an oak. He's a big guy. But it doesn't make me feel like a grasshopper. Do you see what I'm saying? There are some hints at some of these crazy, towering, enormous things that happened. But when David fought Goliath, who was likely between 9 and 11 feet tall, don't forget, Goliath wasn't alone. Goliath had brothers. We know of one whose name is Lami. Lami was so huge, the Bible says his spear was as thick as a weaver's beam, a shaft like a baseball bat in thickness, okay? Ten pounds. Now, they say specifically in Scripture that his spearhead weighed another 15 pounds, just the tip of his spear. What's 10 plus 15? 25, you're awake. Okay, so we have this. Bless you. We have this 25 pounds. Imagine this being just the weight of one of your offensive weapons. Trying to throw it. There's no way. There's no way I can throw it. In fact, let's try it. I'm going to try to throw this over this middle. <laughs> Y'all duck if it comes. Doug, put your hands down. That's mean. There's just, there's no way. There's, there's, it's so stinking heavy. And that's just the tip. Lamy was given these descriptions. It's in there for a reason, this weaver beam. So as we read our passage for today, bring us up to speed what's been happening. Goliath, this madman, comes out every day, and he is ugly and offensive and blasphemous. And he's taunting not only the Israelites, he's mocking the God of Israel. And he comes out day after day, and he comes out and says, oh, who's going to fight me? You dogs, come out. And he's calling people out, and no one goes out. This happens day after day after day. And no one comes out. So Goliath comes out one more time and says, who's going to fight me? In fact, if you can beat me, we'll all be your slaves. But if we win, we get you. We're putting you in chains, and you'll serve us all your days. But this time, someone does come out. It's this little scrappy, ruddy guy who comes out named David. He comes out like with no armor. And Goliath sees him, and evidently he does not like what he sees. Because he makes a comment. He says, what is this? Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? Who is this little guy? And then it says he cursed David by his own false gods, the Philistine pagan gods. And he blasphemed, and he's crude, and he's arrogant. And he goes on to say, I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky, and I will feed your carcass to the wild beasts, little boy. Now we pick up our scripture for today, what David says. Look with me at 1 Samuel 17, and I love how calm he is. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with your sword and your spear, and your little javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies, the God of the ranks of Israel. You have defied him. Don't miss that. You have defied him, Goliath. Today, the Lord will hand you over to me. It's not the other way around. Today, I will strike you down, and I will remove your head, and I will give the corpses of the Philistine camp, this is everybody, not just you, to the birds of the sky, and I'll feed them to the wild creatures of the earth. Then all the world will know that David is great and mighty, and you will pray. Look at where he gives the glory. Then all the world will know there is a God in Israel. And this whole assembly here will know that it's not by sword or by spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's. His hand, he will hand you over to us. Man, there is so much going on here, church. Obviously, we know the overall story here, and we're pretty familiar with this, but I've got some hidden gems that I've just got to share with you. Think about what David just did. He confronted a giant, and he calls him out. And he says, basically, in verse 46, the Lord will deliver you into my hands. And not just you, Goliath. Do, do we get this? But on this day, I will give the carcasses of all y'all. <laughs> that's, that's in there, all y'all. 
I will give not just you, but your entire camp of the Philistines. You all won't escape. You, you can run. You can run to all these other cities. We're going to chase you down. It is you who are going to be fed to the birds and to the beasts. And all the earth will know there is a God in Israel. Talk about brave. Okay? Here's where we miss it. We know how the story ends. We know this. We know this from being a, just a knee-high to a grasshopper. We know this story, so we think we get it. We don't remember how fearful. Do we know what he just did with this? This is huge. There is so much on the line here. First, this is David's moment of truth. This is it. He has put it on the line in front of everyone. He has just called out and probably infuriated a massive giant. Does that sound like fun? Everybody's heard it. Everybody knows David's life is on the line. He comes up, he infuriates this giant, and if God doesn't show up, <laughs> oh, if God is not who David just claimed he was, then David is a dead man. Think about that. It is all in right here. If God doesn't show up and do exactly what David proclaimed he would do, David's over. There's, there, there is no way he is going to, in, in, in his flesh, there is no way he can, he can beat this guy. Everyone there thought he was out of his mind. They had to have. Here's this giant. Imagine this. There's people probably talking him out saying, what are you doing? You can't go. You don't stand a chance against this guy. This is a true warrior. This guy has been trained from birth to kill people and destroy people. And what are you doing? And why? You're practically naked. Where's your wet? Whoa, you got a slingshot. Woohoo! And he's going out. And he's like, I got this. And it is incredible. And we just look at this and we think, yeah, that's cool because we know how it goes. But y'all, they didn't know how this was going to end. They thought they did, but only one person had faith and said, I know how this is going to end. And only one person, be honest, called it right. You know who called it right? David. Because he knew God would deliver this giant into his hands. If he didn't show up, if David didn't have God show up and do this would be the shortest battle in history. Think about that. Let's relate it to modern day terms. You know I love to do that. I want to get practical with this. I want to talk about another modern day near biblical story. See if you recognize this right here. What's that on the right? The Death Star. On the left, we have the forest moon of Endor. There is an attack, the good guys against the bad guys. They have to come and blow up the Death Star. The only problem is it's surrounded by an invisible force field that is impenetrable. So what happens? They send a team led by Han Solo down to the moon to blow up the generator so the shield stops working because the shield is generated from big green planet Endor here. Over here, the Death Star. There's only one problem. You can't see the shield with the naked eye. It's invisible to our human eyes. So when they come and they arrive and they jump out of hyperspace, they have to take on faith, unless they can scan it, they have to take by faith that the victory was won on planet Endor, on the forest moon. You, you see what, all right, let me go farther then. I see the twinkling in your eye. You're close. Yo, this is, I'm going somewhere with this. This is so, so amazing. Don't miss this. For them to be victorious, they had to believe by faith that the shield was down and that it would be delivered into their hands. Are you seeing that? They have to believe the shield was down so that their attack would be successful as told it would be. So when this guy, Lando Calrissian, shows up with creepy dude on the left, he shows up, he actually utters these words. He says, Han will have that shield down, <laughs> or this will be the shortest offensive of all time. Did you get that? They were David trying to take down the big bad Goliath of their time. If that shield isn't down, this would be the shortest battle in history. And just like that, if the Lord doesn't show up and deliver the giant into David's hands, this is going to be the shortest battle in the history of Israel. Now, think how bold David's proclamation is now when he says, you are going down. You will be the one delivered into my hand. Talk about brave and faith and confidence. I got to ask, are you? That job interview you got coming? That financial thing you're wrestling with, your marriage? Do you have faith that God is still in that? Do you have faith that he can deliver? Do you have faith that he can trounce the enemies that are staring down at you? Man, we see an awesome example of bold faith that was rewarded, of confidence. Not only is David's life on the line, church, this is huge. Don't miss this. 
The Messiah is prophesied to come from the lineage of David. Think about this. Matthew follows the royal bloodline of David all the way through Solomon, through, through David, and all the way through. Luke follows it all the way through Nathan, the, the brother of David, the, the son of David. And Jesus is the blood descendant of David through Mary, and he's the legal descendant of David through Joseph. Do you, do you see where this is going? If David dies here today, his lineage dies. If David steps out on that battlefield and he overstates what God's going to do and Goliath manages to kill him, this is the bloodline that the Messiah is supposed to come through. Now do you see what is on the line here when he walks up and boldly says, ha ha, you're going down. If David dies here today, the entire plan of redemption for the whole world, nothing big, <laughs> is at stake here. If David dies, his descent, there are no descendants. This is so huge and we don't get that. Talk about all in poker game. Let's bet the whole thing right here. This is it. This guy's crazy, <gasps> unless he has amazing faith, and he's bold, and he's a hero, and he says, God said you're going to be delivered, and I'm this isn't a high-risk game. What incredible faith is this? But there's another hidden gem. Read with me in verse 49. It says, reaching into the shepherd's bag and taking out a stone, he hurls it with his sling, and he hits the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in, and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. Oh, I love this. This is probably my favorite of all the hidden gems today. This giant was arrogant, and he was proud, and he was blasphemous, and boastful, and crude, and he mocked Israel, and he mocked the God of Israel. And I promise you, this giant of a man would never, never bend his knee before the God of Israel, much less lay face down to worship him. But as I studied this this week, I saw something I had never seen before. This is so cool. You ready? Not if you're ready. The same words used for fell face down are the exact same words used when someone falls face down to worship God, to bow before a superior showing respect. What Goliath failed to do his entire life, what he refused to do every living day he had, he now has to do with his last breath. He falls face down. And it doesn't say he tumbled over. The original language says he fell face down. We use the same one. He fell and had to acknowledge, you are God. There is a God in Israel. This proud, arrogant, boastful man falls down. What he refused to do his entire life, you can bow now or you can bow later, Goliath, but you will bow because Scripture says one day all of us, every knee will bow before God. So if you're here today, or if you're watching, if you're overseas, and you're, I know we got people in Germany watching us today, if you have not come to a place where you have bowed your heart to the Lord, man, don't wait. Don't give that chance up. Humble yourself before God today while there's still time, because Goliath blew it. When he finally fell face down, it was too late. That decision had been made. I love the rich irony here. He fell face down before the God he had just blasphemed. There's another hidden gem. And if you've been coming faithfully the last couple of years, you might have heard this because I shared it once in passing, but it's something that absolutely jumped off the page to me. It was years ago. I had just finished my, my doctorate studies, and I was reading this, and I thought I said, that, I didn't read that right. And I looked, and I said, that can't be right. You ever read a Bible, and you go, I need another Bible. That's not right. That can't be what it says. That's that. Surely, God, you didn't mean that. This is one of those moments. I read it, and I said, that can't be right, because I've always read, or I thought I've read, and I know I've always heard, that David shows up, he has this great battle with Goliath, they fight, he got a sling and a stone, boom, psh, and it's over. And I said, if we, if we raise our hand, 95% of the people in this room would say that's what you were taught. But if we just read the next two verses, we see something amazing that fully explains it. Look at verse 51. It says, then David ran over and pulled Goliath's sword from its sheath. David used it to kill him and cut off his head little trivia. So the sling was used in his execution, but it says here it was Goliath's own sword that was the death blow. Think about that. Goliath's own sword is the instrument of his own execution. Talk about humbling the proud. It's almost like God just knows what he's doing, and he just orchestrates this amazing thing, and he's reminding us there's so much irony for this man who boasted that God was non-existent and that these little false gods they worshiped. How wild is that? 
But there's something else. What happened to the evil race of giants? Why aren't they around today? If you look on in 2 Samuel 21 and 20, we see what is thought to be the last of the giants that are killed off. And it's a bizarre verse that says this. In still another battle, which took place at Gath, surprise, surprise, there was a huge man with six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 in all. He also was descended, surprise, surprise, from Rapha, part of the Raphaim. Why do we think this is the last? Because from here on out, the giants are never mentioned again. There's one obscure passage in Isaiah, I think 45, where there's mentioned the men of stature. It's a passing reference, but you never see them bothering God's family again. And it is this amazing battle that happens, and it's, I love these epic things. And again, if you want to hear the whole thing, go, go find the giant sermon. David does something very bizarre after this. And I bet you haven't thought about it, because I never thought about it. There's one more verse that says, after David killed the giant, he did something bizarre. He says, David then took Goliath's head, and he brought it to Jerusalem. But he took his armor and his sword, Goliath's weapons, and he put it in his own tent. Why did he do that? Well, you'll have to come next time because that, I am out of time. That is a whole sermon in itself of what happens with the bloodline from the devil all the way through. And this is so amazing. And maybe see me after church, I'll share an abbreviated version of it. But I want to leave time for the final challenge for you. Two final hidden gems that are just perfectly timed for you and me this week. Because Thursday is what? Thanksgiving. I started thinking about this. And I said, like, Lord, what, what do you want me to send your people out with as we go? And this came to me. This is so profound. Don't miss it. If you miss anything, this is what you need to take with you. Why was David victorious? Why? What was the key to his success? Here it is right here. Before David fought his famous battle, we didn't read this part. Before he went out and stepped foot on the ground and tried to conquer the giant, he did something that is so powerful. And frankly, we don't do it enough. David proclaimed God's faithfulness. That was the key to his success. But he did it a little bit off the side. He was with Saul, and he says this amazing thing. Now think about what he does. He proclaims two things about God's faithfulness. David said, the Lord delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear. I fought these wild beasts, and the Lord delivered me, okay? So right there, he's publicly acknowledging God for delivering him from all the problems he had, his ferocious beast that he, this is his way of thanking him for what God has done in the past. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on to say, he does something even more impressive to me. I love his faith. He says, and he will deliver me from this hand of that Philistine. Do you see what he just did? He steps out in faith and proclaims God's faithfulness for something that hadn't even happened yet. How many times do we do that? How many times do we know God is in something? We, you know what? I can't even see it. I can't even see this road. I believe, God, you are going to do this. And he stepped out of faith. He thanked God and proclaimed for something God hadn't even done yet. Not only has God delivered me in the past, he says, he will deliver me in the future. So my challenge for us today, because Thanksgiving is coming up, is don't wait for Thanksgiving to proclaim God's faithfulness. Don't do that. Maybe today you want to come and just spend a moment just thanking God for what he's done for you, for who he is, maybe for what he's done in your family, maybe how he's provided for you. Maybe you're blessed and you know it. He's calling you to be a blessing to somebody else. Maybe you've been drifting away just a little bit, and this season he is wooing you back. Don't wait for Advent. Don't wait for Thanksgiving. Come back today. Kneel before him. Show that humility. I love that, where we bow before him thanking him. He has delivered us from our enemies. Maybe you just need to spend a moment and thank him for that. And while you're at it, while you're praying, while you make this last song, your time of worship, thank him for what he's going to do in your life. Don't wait for Thanksgiving to give him thanks. Will you proclaim his faithfulness? It's the key to your victory. Proclaim God's faithfulness, not only for what he's done in the past, but what he's going to do, because we serve an awesome God. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you that you are the God of providence, that you give us everything we need, that you hold nothing back. I thank you that you have made a way where sometimes, frankly, there seems to be no way. I thank you for this great group of people, Lord, who have chosen to be here today to hear your word, to sing to you, to worship you. And now, Lord, I pray that you would visit us yet again with your presence. 
that you would speak to us during this time as we sing to you, as we pray. Lord, would you just make yourself real to us today. For those who are struggling, those who feel a mile away, God, you will draw near to the heart that is humble, that is contrite before you. So Lord, we humble ourselves. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. Do what only you can. In Jesus' name, amen.